Hello, everyone. <laughs> so I'm checking, make certain we're live everywhere. Um, there we go. It seems like we're live on Facebook. Um, let me make certain we're live on Periscope. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Let me make certain. Hello. Hello, everyone. Let me make certain we're live everywhere. Seems like we're on Periscope. Let me... Make certain we're reconnecting everywhere. Discord, Twitch, YouTube. Okay. Trying to connect a few other places. Huh. Trying to get Discord back online and it seems like it's being a booger. So I might have to fix that later. But it seems like we're logged everywhere else. Hello. Hello everyone. <laughs> Good morning. Yay, we got you guys going on here. So today's topic is a little bit controversial. We are going to talk about human evolution. So this is one like second place for um, a couple of polls in a row and this week it won first place. And I believe the work that we're looking at over here, thanks for making the lower settings available on Twitch. Oh, you're welcome. I'm trying to, I'm still trying to navigate a lot of different um, platforms and it seems like I'm having issues with Discord. So if you're talking to me on Discord, um, I've had technical issues all freaking morning. It's like my laptop froze and then Office didn't want to load and then my Chrome is like, we're just going to quit working right now. And But I finally got all that working. So now we're on Twitch. If you talk to me on Discord, you can always ask me questions there. And if you haven't gotten a, um, a link to join the Discord chat, let me know. Um, I have loads of people on there now. And sometimes that's the easiest way to contact me is through Discord, especially if you're having problems emailing me through my website. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so I'm just a monkey. How can life be more worse? I didn't say you're just a monkey. None of us are monkeys. We're primates, but we're not monkeys. So human evolution. This tends to be a bit of a controversial topic. So what I'm going to do is talk primarily about the evidence, how it is that scientists have learned what we've learned, and why, you know, how it is we're sharing it with everybody else. So um, this is pretty close. <laughs> Subatomic particles were moving up there. So um, if, you're, if your topic didn't win this week, guess what? That's okay. I always put the um, topics back into the polls and then we go in for another round of voting. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with human evolution. I believe the work that we're looking at over here, so I want to make certain I give credit where credit is due, is through um, the paleontological, paleontologist slash artist John Gersh. So this is like his recreations and his work, and so this is an animated GIF of a lot of um, how it's how we've transitioned through time. All right, so what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to kind of hit the basics. We're going to talk about what is it? You know, what is this human evolution that we're talking about? You know, and, and some people actually kind of are resistant to it. But I find that a lot of people who are resistant to human evolution, it kind of goes against some things that they've um, been taught throughout their lives. And they find um, doesn't quite sync up with what they think humanity is. But to me... Um, in many ways, human evolution and the 
the evidence there kind of reinforces just how incredible Homo sapiens are and how incredible our species is. We are the only animals that we know of that have managed to leave our planet and explore space. This is something that's pretty profound and, and it does inherently make us special. But because um, a lot of people think that we were just made the way that we are and that there were no previous versions of us kind of go against what it is to be human in my opinion. Humans are constantly working in a way. We kind of are constantly working to make our own species better. We also like to have different versions of technology. So we have our different iOS systems, different versions of that. So we can, we actively work to make things better down the line. We know on a biological level that things change over time, living things do. And kind of similarly, we kind of get better at being who we are in um, human form. I still wish these gifts didn't show we evolved to be a white male. That's fair. We have a huge diversity in, um, in the human population. And we see that wonderful diversity kind of expressed throughout the different environments that we have um, moved through. So the first thing we kind of need to understand if we're going to conquer this thing called human evolution is what exactly is evolution? Well, it's change over time. We know things evolve. We know that things have changed throughout history. We can see that in all kinds of different ways. And so we, when we say the theory of evolution through natural selection, natural selection is the thing that drives that change. All right. So we know for a fact that change over time happens. This is observable. So we can observe this change over time in, in the various different types of um, evidence that we have. Now the theory of evolution explains how these things change. So a lot of people get very, very confused about, well, it's just the theory. Well, we kind of need to kind pick that apart. A theory in regard to like what you see on the TV versus, yes, it's descent with modification. That's essentially what it is, you know? So descent with modification is exactly what we're looking at. So when we're talking about a theory, what does that entail? Well, a theory is a reasonable and substantial explanation supported by tremendous and time-tested evidence as to how a particular natural occurrence happens. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. We know living things change over time. We see that actively in genetics. We can see it in viruses. We see it in bacteria and animals. We also see it in the fossil record, embryology, comparative anatomy, and biochemistry. The fact that things change over time is not in dispute. We know evolution happens. We know for a fact things change over time due to the substantial amount of evidence showing that this happens. The theory of evolution through natural selection is our explanation as to how this happens. Changes in the genetic code over substantial amounts of time alter the protein expression that we see. We are all products of our expressed genetic code. Those are our blueprints to make us who we are, right? And so our, our um, different biological processes express this into what we see in ourselves and in other animals. Now, we share genetic code with other animals. Part of our genetic code doesn't really change as it has shown to be highly beneficial. This is what we call conserved DNA. This is code for like respiration, metabolism, living essentials, different types of um, biological processes that are essential for life, if you will. These haven't changed so much as they seem to work well. Now let's talk about what has changed. This is what we're looking at in regard to human evolution. So I'm trying 
my computer is a bit slow today. It's like, hello, I want to just jump around and cause you problems, but I did reboot and so hopefully that will help. All right, so what are we looking at here? In regard to early humans versus modern humans, we are human version 8.0. <laughs> now the earliest humans were as old as three million years ago. And this, but our earliest ancestors started from hominins. Okay, Mel, can you talk about junk DNA in the human genome? I can address that in a little bit. Let me get to this part and then we'll kind of circle back around to there. Um, when they say we're finding out, I will make a note. We were initially thought, and see this is the wonderful thing about science. Science, when there's new evidence, they modify. They modify the explanations as new evidence is presented. Um, so that's why people are like, well, science is so inconsistent. Science is going to correct itself. It's self-correcting and like evolution, it can change over time. But the thing that's important to notice here, nothing about human evolution has completely and totally changed. Um, we are finding new species that pop up here and they were like, oh my gosh, this was a thing. This is a new version of humans over here. And guess what? They coincided and coexisted with these humans over here. They might have even been crossbreeding. How awesome is that? So science doesn't get like completely upset or, oh my gosh, I'm not right anymore. That's not how science works. So with junk DNA, they initially thought that there was no particular purpose and it was obsolete DNA, but they're still learning that this junk DNA that they coined a bit earlier actually might still have some function. So those are some things that we're learning about, um, especially when you consider that certain parts of the genetic code can be turned on and off in various types of environment. We have the NASA twin study to actually kind of show us a little bit how removing gravity can actually shut off and turn on different genes inside of a human being. Natural selection at work, guys. The environment in actually plays a role in gene expression. And so this is what we mean by human evolution. Whenever the environment shifts, we tend to see new traits pop up. We can see these various mutations. Um, and some, as an aside, in regards to these types of mutations, we're finding out that there are um, more mutations associated with like older fathers. So older men who have babies tend to have a higher rate of mutation in their sperm. So this is pretty interesting. That's kind of where we're getting to where that molecular clock to try to understand how many um, mutations have caused um, our species to kind of diverge. So let's talk a bit more about this thing called human evolution. So I'm gonna show you um, this particular chart and I'm gonna remove myself so you can see this chart a bit better. This comes to us from the Natural History Museum. Look at all the versions of people we have. <laughs> so we start back about seven million years ago. We have our early hominins. Hello, hello Iron Charioteer, hello Garner, Jay Garner. Um, so if you have questions, Please feel free to shoot me a question here and if you apps if you happen to watch this particular episode after the fact you can leave me a question in the comments and or message me on Twitter you can also hit me up on Twitch as well as discord I have my own discord so you can check that out okay so here we have early hominins so we start out this is where our earliest ancestors are so i'm just looking at the human timeline we'll talk a bit more about what about monkeys we're going to completely get into all that in a minute so what we see is we start to see this transition about seven million years ago our earliest early hominin shows up and then we move on to the australopithecines and then our robust versions, and then they branch off into where we see the early humans happen about three million years ago. Now what's interesting, what's interesting is that at one point in time around between today, a bit earlier than today, we have Homo florensiensis, oh gosh, florensiensis, 
and Neanderthals, these three versions of humans, homos that is, all coexisted at one point in time. You're welcome. So all of these versions of human coexisted at one point in time. And so I'm going to talk a bit about how it is that we know all of the things that we know because I imagine there are people who are like, well, there's, there's controversy in what actually scientists agree on and that sort of thing. Well, let me get into the timeline. So we're going to start from a long time ago. You're welcome. Yay! So we're going to start around 55 million years ago. The first primitive primates start to evolve. Okay, so they start the first primitive versions, you know, people are like we didn't come from no monkeys. Well, you know, we're not We didn't come from any monkeys that are alive today. We had a common ancestor So this is where we see our first common ancestor 55 million years ago first primates evolved around 8 to 6 we see gorillas later on chimps and human lineages diverge. So that's right after the six million years ago, somewhere around there. So about the seven million years ago, as I had mentioned before, that's where we had that common ancestor with chimps. And then we diverged about six million years ago. Now about 5.8 million years ago, the oldest human ancestor thought to have walked on two legs existed. This is the, um, or, <laughs> Science has such funny words. Auroran to genesis, genesis, O-R-R-O-R-I-N, auroran, T-U-G-E-N-E-N-S-I-S, to genesis. This is why I probably should have taken Latin. Anyway, <laughs> happy six millionth birthday, that's right. Now let's jump ahead to 5.5 million years ago. Um, our our diplicus, that's our early hominins that we showed that I showed you on the previous right? They start to share traits with chimps and gorillas, and they are forest dwelling little peoples. So about four million years ago, the Australopithecines appear. They have no brains. They have <laughs> they have no brains. They have brains that are no larger than a chimps. And that, that particular brain is a volume of around 400 to 500 milliliters or cubic centimeters if you prefer. They do walk upright on their um, two legs and they're the first human ancestors to live out on the savanna. So that's pretty cool. So let's jump ahead to about 3.2 million years ago. This is where we see Lucy, that famous Australopithecus afarensis. She lives near what we now call Hater, Ethiopia. Now this is where we're at. We're at about 3 million years ago. So approximately 2.7 million years ago, Paranthropus lives in the woods and the grasslands. They have huge jaws for chomping on the roots and the vegetation. They end up going extinct about 1.2 million years ago. So they had a pretty good long run, didn't they? Around 2.5, we start to see the first Homo species pop up. Homo habilis. <laughs> Homo habilis appears. Now, that particular um, species, the face protrudes less than earlier hominids, but they still retain a lot of the eight features that we see. The brain volume is around 600 milliliters, so we've had an increase a little bit. Um, was that almost double? Almost double was about, what was it? Three, it, well, it was about 400 to 500 milliliters. This is about six, so not quite double, about 50% increase. They start to use stone tools regularly, and they created it by splitting pebbles. That starts this, this actually starts the Old One tradition of tool making. That lasts for a about a million years. <laughs> I do wonder how long our run will be. Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, so this lasts about a million years for this particular tool making. Now these hominins start to develop meaty rich diets. So they become scavengers. Now that extra energy kind of might have 
favored a bit of the evolution of the larger brains. I'm actually going to talk about the evolution of the human brain later on in this talk. <laughs> Who are the first hominids to use and control fire? Well, we're right in the middle of, of the timeline. So now we've, we're starting to see that early humans show up. You know, this is about 3 million years ago. So around 2 million years ago, Homo ergaster, they show up with a brain volume of 850 milliliters. And we see them in Africa. Now we're getting to Homo erectus, 1.8 to 1.5. <laughs> what about Australopithecus africanus and Sabina? Well, I haven't gotten into um, those particular, uh, those particular, um, Australopithecus species just yet. Let me get through the rest of the timeline. <laughs> so diva. Yes, it's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. So we have Homo erectus found in Asia. Now they're considered the first true hunter gatherer ancestor. And they're also the first to have been considered to have migrated out of Africa in large numbers. And they have a brain size of about one liter. So we've jumped from about from 400 to 600 to 800 milliliters to 1,000 milliliters. So we're already up to one liter. Yeah, we know so little about them, but we're learning. Science learns. That's wonderful. So about 1.6 million years ago, this is where we see the first sporadic use of fire. <sighs> Combustion. Suggested, and how we know this is by the discolored sediments in the Kubi Fora in Kenya. So the more convincing evidence of this is also charred wood and stone tools that have been found in Israel and dated to about 780,000 years ago. Now these more part, um, complex type of stone tools called um, Akulian start to be produced and they're pretty much the um, choice technology and the primary technology until as um, late as 100,000 years ago. Can we use their skulls to hold the liquid? <laughs> Volume isn't always about liquid, guys. Now we get to see, as, we, as once we get the bigger brains, we start to see um, a rapid um, diversification in species down to the hundred thousands of years, especially when we consider milestones in um, the human race or the human species. So Homo heidelbergensis lives in Africa and Europe. This is about 600,000 years ago. They have about a similar brain volume to modern humans we see today. Now, 100,000 years later, the earliest evidence of um, shelters that were built for a particular purpose show up, these wooden huts. And they're known... Um, from sites that they've dug around Chichibu, Japan. 400,000 years ago, we're almost done, guys. It's just like, it's rapid. We have so many milestones that have hit around the, like within just 100,000 years of each other. It's fantastic. So we see humans hunting with spears about 400,000 years ago. The oldest surviving early human footprints are found around 325, thousand years ago from people who scrambled down the slopes of a volcano in Italy. Hmm. <laughs> About 280,000 years ago, we see complex blades <clears throat> as well as grinding stones. So we're getting better with our tools. <laughs> Can I send you a source on... Oh, okay, sorry. So... <clears throat> Neanderthals. Now we're at Neanderthals 230,000 years ago. That's really not that long ago when you consider how long humans have been evolving. 200,000 years ago, Neanderthals appear and are found all over Europe, from Britain in the west <coughs> to Iran in the east. They are all over the place until they become extinct with the advent of what we see in modern humans about 28,000 years ago. So, 28,000 years ago, Neanderthals went extinct. 
And the thing is, is they coexisted with humans. Hmm. Did fire contribute to increased brain size from cooked food, which is more nutrient dense and safer to eat? That's a good question. I'm actually going to talk a bit about how, what the current ideas are, or at least the theories are, behind brain development in humans in just a bit. I'm not going to leave y'all hanging. So, um, all right. Now, now we're up to our own species, Homo sapiens. Our own um, species, Homo sapiens, appears on the scene about 195,000 years ago. So, oh, hey, Jackson. Hominidae is the great ape family. Hominins are the apes more closely related to humans than chips. Yes, that's correct. And thank you for answering that question, Jackson. You should hop over to Jackson's channel, too. He's pretty cool, and he talks about evolution a lot. So now we're about 195,000 years ago, and that's where we see our own modern humans kind of pop up. Shortly after, they begin to migrate all over Asia, Europe, but we still know the oldest modern human remains are skulls, just two of them, found in Ethiopia that date to this period. And at this point in time, we're at a brain volume of 1.35 liters, or 1,000 1,350 milliliters, if you prefer. So at this point, we've more than doubled the size of our brains from early humans. Now, if you're familiar with mitochondrial Eve, she shows up about 170,000 years ago, and she's considered the direct ancestor to all living people today and may have been living in Africa. So, mitochondrial Eve, if you're not familiar how that works, you get all of your mitochondrial DNA from your mother, which is actually a pretty um, resourceful tool to have because it also helps trace migratory patterns of early humans all across the world, all the way back to the central mitochondrial Eve. You should really check that out. And if you haven't, you can look up, I believe it's National Geographic, Mitochondrial Eve, and have a look. Now about 150,000 years ago, um, this is where humans possibly became capable of speaking. So we think this, this is kind of where speech kind of has hit, where they're able to actually talk to one another in that regard. And then we also see old shell jewelry. And um, that kind of shows up about 100,000 years ago. So this is kind of leading to the idea that this is where people start to develop this complex speech and also symbolism which is kind of important, especially to various groups to, of our homo sapiens nowadays. We still have symbolism here. All right, we're in the home stretch. 140,000 years ago, first evidence of long distance trade. So we started trading about then. And so then we've got 110,000 years ago, we got the earliest beads, and so we've got ostrich eggshells and jewelry. So we start getting our bling, we still got it going on. Now this is where about 50,000 years ago is considered what we call the great leap forward. This is where human culture starts to change rapidly, um, more so than, than before. So people start burying their dead ritually. There's making clothes from animal hides. We, we see the development of complex hunting. So they have new techniques. So they have pit traps. We also see the early colonization of Australia by modern humans. So we see this huge leap forward in human culture to start to develop. 33,000 years ago, oldest cave art. Now later the Stone Age artisans, they make the spectacular murals at Lascaux and Chavot in France. And around this time, so just 33 years ago, 28,000 years ago, Neanderthal, Neanderthals died. Now we're getting to where, this is where we start to see the death of Homo erectus. So they die out in Asia. 18,000 years ago, that's where we see the Homo floresiensis. Oh words, man, words are so hard sometimes. <laughs> Floresiensis. So that's Homo floresiensis. This is what we call the Hobbit people. Hobbits has existed, my precious. <laughs> and they're found on Indonesia island of Flores, hence the name Floresiensis. 
Now they stand just about a meter tall. That's about three feet for those of you that are still on that particular um, measuring system. Their brains are similar to the size of chimpanzees, but they have advanced stone tools. So here's the thing to consider. Brain size does not necessarily mean capabilities and chimps have their own language and we I, and it's said that now they've entered the stone age. So wouldn't that be interesting if we see a rapid progression of an evolution in chimps? That would be something to witness, huh? Hmm. Now, we're getting closer along to where we're familiar. 12,000 years ago, we have people reach the Americas. 10,000 years ago, agriculture develops and spreads. This is where we see the first villages. Impossible domestication of doggies. Woohoo! So then... 5,500 years ago, Stone Age ends, Bronze Age begins, humans begin to smelt and work copper in tin, and then they start to use those in place of stone. 5,000 years ago, earliest known writing. So they've been in oral history for a very long time. What? It was like, what? Over 100,000 years. It was probably, what, 180,000 years. They've just been talking. Now, this is where we get the writing. 5,000 years ago. And then 4,000 to 3,500 BC, this is where we see the Sumerians and Mesopotamia develop the world's first civilization. So, that gives you the rundown on human evolution, the oral story version. And if you didn't catch all of that, guess what? This video will be up forever. In addition to that, all of my slides will be put on scientistmail.com. This particular spread comes to us from Scientific American, and I will put that link on my slides as well. And you can kind of go and check this out yourself and see what you think. So maybe the Planet of the Apes isn't too far-fetched. <laughs> Probably not. So, before I start to get people hopping on here and going, but how do scientists know it happened this way? How do we know the things? How do we know the things? How, how, how? You guys like my little Darwin thing? There's actually a video game you can play where you can play as Darwin, and that's one of his power moves is the evolution move, and he goes through. Power move! So if you haven't checked out that video game, you can, you can have a look. It's the scientist video game. We are great apes. We are great apes. Absolutely. I think we're, <laughs> not only are we super great, but we are part of the great, great, I almost said grape ape, great ape family. So that's quite important to kind of keep that in mind. All right. So how do we do this? You know, many people who deny human evolution often think that there's some confusion among the scientific community about the evidence for human evolution. There's really not much confusion. Well, there's really not confusion at all. And or that there is no definitive proof. Let's talk about what science has found, and you can decide for yourself. Ah, yes, I always like likes. Please like, subscribe. I also have a Patreon, so if you want to buy me a coffee, it's just a dollar a month. And tomorrow is Science Sunday School, just for my patrons, where I talk about all of the latest advances in science every Sunday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. All right, so what we first have to kind of do is talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of break down what is evolution. Now, the information that I'm giving to you now, you can actually find on the Smithsonian website. They have an entire thing called the Human Origins Project. So when we're talking about evolution, we start out with our earliest ancestors. And as a beneficial gene shows up, that gene tends to stick around. For instance, polar bears used to be brown. They used to be brown, but when what they what happened was is there was this mutation that caused certain bears to have white fur. Well, since they were easier to, to camouflage and hide, they were able to get food more readily than their brown brothers and sisters and cousins and of the like. So the white bears tend to stick around. This is kind of what we mean about small changes over time. So then they went from being brown bears to being white polar bears. Now, when we consider that the polar ice caps are melting, if 
that brown gene shows up again and we lose the ice caps, that might give brown bears an edge again. But will the polar bears have enough time to actually evolve and change or at least adapt to that pressing environment to where it's becoming a big issue? Who knows? So, <laughs> so now let's talk a bit about how this applies to humans. All right, the modern human is a long time coming. So speciation is something that takes a very long time in complex organisms. There is no fish giving birth to a mammal scenario. That's not going to happen. Modern humans are the products of 3.5 billion years of evolution. If evolution happened so quickly, it would be seen in the fossil record genetics, biochemistry, embryology, etc. Humans evolved from small changes over a substantial period of time, of which I just long-windedly shared with you. Um, and this wasn't a let's be humans as quick as possible situation. This took a very, very, very long time. So let's talk a bit about, what about monkeys? <laughs> We are primates, just like monkeys, but we did not evolve from monkeys or primates living today. We had a common ancestor. Now, the monkeys diverged from our ancestor and became better at being monkeys. You know, they're at monkey version, what, 8.0? <laughs> well, chimps diverged from our an ancestor and got better at being chimps. Chimp version, 6.0, 7.0, 8.0, and so on and so forth. We diverged. From our common ancestor and became better at being human. So while we have similarities on many levels, that only comes from the fact that we shared an ancestor 25 million years ago. I repeat that. That was 25 million years ago. <laughs> so we're talking about a long period of time in order for human version 8.0 to develop. So it's not something that happened overnight. We had these small changes over a substantial period of time, and those small changes were enough. So if we compare ourselves to our earliest ancestor, of course, we are vastly different, but that's the product of 25 million years. 25 million years. That wasn't last week. It wasn't 10 years ago. It wasn't 100,000 years ago. It wasn't even two. It was 25 million years ago. That's enough time for that much change to happen. And to think, if you go back that far, if you were to think that that change couldn't occur, then not only is that a little bit short-sighted, it's actually kind of quite ignorant because we can see substantial changes happen within species on what we call the genetic molecular clock. We ourselves have, have um, genes that are constantly changing. The older you get, the more likely you're going to have mutations within your gametes. This is something that we can observe. All right. <laughs> now you might say, is human evolution a straight line? Well, no, like success, it is not a straight line. So if you're familiar at all with trying to be successful, success is often like, um, you know, up a hill, down a hill, round circle and around the bend. It's not linear. Many times in the past, humans have had different species coexist. Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Floresiens, oh, there we go, Flores, Floresiensis, Floresiensis lived at the same time. So we had our Neanderthals, our little hobbit people, and our modern humans all coexisting at one point. Now the thing is, Homo sapiens are the only survivors. And there's some debate on that, why that happened. Homo sapiens were, um, were capable of strategy, something that some of the others that we don't see a whole lot of um, manifest in, in the evidence there. There is a retrovirus found in every single mammal tested to, um, so far carried from the first mammal. So neat. That sounds interesting. I'll have to... I'll have to check that out. And then so I might still have people saying, but how do we know? How do we know? How do we know? What is the evidence? Layers, my friend. Things die and settle in layers. We also have the reali uh, re reliability 
of um, knowing the rate of decay on various elements, and that has um, proven to be reproducible and highly predictable. So things die in layers. So the, the further down you go, the older it is. And we can date these particular layers based on these different type of radiochemical type of qualities. So let's talk a bit about these different methods of radiometric dating. <laughs> All right. So the ones that I'm going to talk about today are potassium argon dating, argon argon dating, and carbon-14, also known as radiocarbon. Then I'm going to talk about um, other, types, other types of tests that scientists do in order to determine how old something is. So, and also the uranium series, and I'm going to leave that out. So those particular, um, what we call radiometric dating, these methods measure the radioactive decay of different chemical elements. Now, this particular decay occurs in a consistent manner. It's just like clockwork. In fact, there's a certain type of isotope of cesium that decays every second, and that's how we can determine how long a second is. Another thing that we use is thermoluminescence. So this is what we call optically stimulated luminescence and something called electron spin resonance. So this has to deal with um, different ways of measuring the amount of electrons that get absorbed and trapped inside a rock, a bone, a tooth over time. So you can measure that. There's also a cool thing called paleomagnetism. Now this particular method compares the direction of the magnetic particles in the different layers of sediment to the known worldwide shifts in what we know to be Earth's magnetic field. Now we have well-established dates using other dating methods along with this paleomagnetism to kind of double check and calibrate. Then there's another thing called biochronology. Now we know for a fact that animal species change over time. The fauna can be arranged from younger species to older species. Now at some particular sites, we can find animal fossils that are dated precisely by one of these other methods. Now for sites that are not so easily dated, the animal species found there can be compared to well-dated species from other sites. So in this way, we have the sites that don't have the radioactive or other materials for dating can be given a reliable age particular estimate by comparing these different types of fauna and these different types of animal species that would have existed at that time from other known sites that have been well established through the radiometric dating. I hope that makes sense. That's biochronology. Then we have something that's really cool called the molecular clock. This particular method takes the amount of genetic difference between living organisms and kind of computes a particular age based on well-tested rates of genetic mutation over time. Now, since we know DNA decays rapidly, the molecular clock method can't date very old fossils because DNA has a shelf life. It's primarily useful for figuring out how long living species or populations shared a common ancestor. So if you take chimps and humans and count the differences, you can kind of backtrack because you know the rate of mutation in chimps, you know the rate of mutation in humans, you can go back and kind of calculate how often those changes would have occurred and where they would have diverged from a common ancestor. But molecular clock by itself is not enough. You have to take that in coordination with where you found the fossils. You have to take that in coordination with radiometric dating, thermoluminescence, paleomagnetism, biochronology. All of these particular methods are used in coordination with each other and not just stand alone. So it's important to kind of remember that. It's not just one test. It's many tests to reinforce this particular type of relationship. That's pretty interesting. All right. My computer is slowing down. All right, so now I'm gonna show you a timeline of what we're dealing with in, in the particular milestones in regards to human evolution and um, what types of dating were used during that time. And again, 
This comes to us from the Smithsonian. So if you're interested, you can check out their Human Origins project and kind of dive in a bit further. And um, I'll have those links on my slideshow as well. So if we're looking at about four to seven million years ago, the primary um, types of methods used to determine the milestone over the humans and chimps diverge is molecular genetic clock and the argon dating. So those are the methods that are primarily used for that sort of thing. Now if we look at um, about, let's see, let me pull up. There we go, that's easier. If we look at about four million years ago, where we start to see the bipedal walking that becomes well developed, we look primarily at argon. Then around the 2.6 million part where we see the oldest stone tool making, we're able to look at those tools and date them according to argon and paleomagnetic. 1.8, Homo erectus expands out of Africa, argon and paleomagnetic. Then we look at the rapid brain expansion, that really cool time period between 800,000 years ago and 200,000 years ago. We use argon, uranium series, and paleomagnetic methods in order to determine the, the size of the brain increase. We're moving forward with the culture where we see the Neanderthals emerge, Homo sapiens emerge. This is where we get a lot of substantial um, testing. Thermoluminescence, electron spin resonance, carbon-14, molecular genetic clock. Then we move on to carbon-14 dating um, to around the agriculture years. And then with the writing state societies and civilization, primarily carbon-14 dating. So these are all of the different types of methods they use in order to date these, this particular type of evidence. Now we're moving on to what about brains? Brains, 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 brains. <laughs> Our brains have expanded rapidly over a short period of time. We have a huge amount of information and we see the progression of human society and civilization and all of the tools and the talking and the writing and the agriculture and all this sort of thing kind of just vastly um, move us forward so quickly. And a lot of that has to do with our, um, what scientists figure to be um, the, our, our huge, awesome brains. So let's talk a little bit about that. And then we'll be almost done. Woohoo! I hope you guys have enjoyed this talk. This has been really fun to talk about and kind of share with people. All right, so um, I believe this is from Scientific American. I believe this is from Scientific American. No, it's from New Science. I think it's either Scientific American or New Scientist. <laughs> At the cost of our beautiful muscular jaws. <laughs> Huh. All right, so when we're looking at, when we were going through this timeline, I was going with you, we look at the first two thirds of history. The size of our ancestors' brains was within the range of what we see with our other apes, you know, gorillas and chimps and that sort of thing. So that was around 400 to 500 milliliters as we were talking about. And so <clears throat> chimpanzees, their skulls are hold around 400 milliliters. And gorillas up to as much as 700 milliliters. Now during this time, we see that Australopithecine brains, they started to show this subtle change in structure compared with these other apes. So an example would be that neocortex that had begun to expand and that started to reorganize the functions from visual processing toward other regions of the brain. I'm so glad you guys are enjoying this. Um, so when we're looking at the last third of our evolution, we saw nearly all the action in the brain size. We saw this huge just move forward in, in to, to where it's what, 1.3, 1.4 milliliters. Um, well, no, liters, 1.3, 1.4 liters size brain now. We got these big, awesome brains. So this includes an expansion of, you remember when we were talking about the, uh, where language started to form. So that's part of the frontal lobe called the Broca's area. The very first fossil skulls of Homo erectus, that's almost 2 million years ago, had brains that averaged just a little bit larger than 600 mil milliliters. So that's a little more than half a liter. And we've jumped up to a, um, uh, more than twice that now. All right, so from here, 
we look at this slow upward march to getting to about a liter by about 500,000 years ago. So these early Homo sapiens had brains within the range of people today, so about 1.2 to 1.3 milliliters. Now at this particular stage, the brains that we see, as we see, they kind of grew to accommodate all these different changes that we see. Now, this particular, um, these particular changes, we kind of see the, that they're accentuated in particular regions where there's depths of planning, where we see lots of planning, where we see lots of communication, we see lots of problem solving. And so we see these more advanced cognitive functions around that time period. And so that's how we're able to kind of say, okay, well, not only do we have the fossil record with the actual size of the skulls, but we also have all of these other artifacts associated with that to kind of reinforce this planning, this um, advanced cognitive type of functions that we associate with modern humans. Now, there is some irony that over the past 10,000 years, human existence kind of actually shrank our brains <laughs> a little bit. But they're kind of associating that with limited nutrition in early agricultural populations. So there might not have been as much nutrition when they started out learning how to do agriculture. Now, when industrial societies in the past hundred years, what we've seen now is brain size has rebounded from that. So we're looking more at um, in, an increase in nutrition as well as a decrease in disease. Now, the past doesn't necessarily predict the future evolution, but being able to understand technology and genetic engineering might actually kind of adjust our brain size as well. So since we're able to kind of lower the incidence of disease and now that we're introducing genetic engineering, it's kind of uncertain about how this is what, what our trend's gonna be in the future with brain size and what that's going to mean and entail. So, <laughs> I've got my favorite little Darwin gift right here. You're like, yes, this is probably one of my favorite gifts, is this Darwin. So you might say, what about Darwin? We haven't really talked so much about Darwin. Um, we have learned a lot since Darwin. We know the age of the earth gives organisms plenty of time to have evolved to their current forms. We have the discovery of DNA has given us great understanding as to how organisms have changed over time. It has also shown that we are related to one another. The fossil record has gained millions, literally millions of specimens showing the transition of one species into a slightly different mod modified species. Darwin was the first step. We have jumped and leaped beyond his capabilities at this point. Now, some people will be like, well, why aren't there still other versions of humans walking around? Well, that's kind of the thing. Just because a particular species has gone extinct doesn't necessarily mean that it should have been living around. Some extinction is kind of um, integral in order to evolve into a different species. The extinction of one species and the appearance of another species is just that. Sometimes the extinction of the previous form is because the newer species is now around. Um, so extinction isn't necessarily something that, you know, we, we don't, we were, we're not going to see a lot of forms of um, past ancestors coexisting necessarily. You have to have past ancestors kind of die off in order for newer versions to kind of show. <laughs> you miss the other hominins. <laughs> oh goodness. But still, you know, we know things change over time and these are, this is all the evidence for that. So this is kind of what I've covered over um, this particular talk. Human evolution, what is it? How does it happen? What is the evidence? Hopefully I've kind of cleared up a lot of that because we do have individuals that don't quite understand the evidence behind human evolution and just how substantial it is. This is the best explanation to how we've changed over this long period of time because we know we've changed. We don't stay the same. That is the very essence of life is change over time. And to assume that we've always been this way over the millions and millions and millions of years that we've existed 
it, it would be extremely, you know, unimaginative and kind of quite disappointing to think that we've always just been this way. And genetics and science and everything that we've learned about humans show that that's not the case. We're living longer now due to medical science. Why wouldn't we get better over time with um, what we're doing? I mean, to me, it's just, it's anti-human to think that humans could never change. It's just, it just goes against what the very essence of humanity is, in my humble opinion. We change over time and that's okay. There's not a thing wrong with that. <laughs> but it's, it's a controversial topic. And I think um, largely because the fact that we are special, the fact that we are special, we are the only animals that we know of that have managed to build rockets and leave the planet. This is, this is a profound thing and this is an amazing thing. But that doesn't mean we didn't have early versions of ourselves to overcome and just be better at. So that's kind of how I see it. Will natural selection stop affecting humans? Oh, I don't think so. We're always going to be subjective to natural selection, especially with the way that the climate's going. We are going to have to adapt and evolve if we continue to do things to our world that affects the way that it um, responds to us in the form of climate. We're going to have a lot of issues with food. So humans are going to have to adapt and evolve um, and deal with, with what we got coming. We were compensating, missing out on the fang claw department. Okay, so I have a typo on this next slide. This isn't cancer. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> this isn't cancer. These are all of my sources on, um, on this. There's so much information available on human evolution. Humanorigins.si.edu. New Scientist, Natural History Museum in London has a fantastic website on human evolution. Here's a really cool article that I found from The Guardian, um, why we're closer than ever to a timeline for human evolution, Scientific American on how the human brain evolved. And if you're interested on how people are resistant to evolution, there's really cool information on Pew Research as far as statistics and that sort of thing. So I'm going to take a moment to thank my patrons. I have new patrons. Woohoo! So here are all my awesome people that make what I do possible. Um, if you can spare a dollar a month, my patrons are responsible for me being able to do as many shows as I do. They're why I have a website. They're why I have a new camera. They're why I have a lot of the different things that I can do to kind of contribute to scientific literacy. So thank you, Tony, James, Lauren, Jen, Carl, Melanie, Patrick, Daniel, Stephen, Paula, Tim, Carrie, Cersei, Keith, Duke, James, Andy, Zachary, Tony, Bo, Stephen, Sarah, Graham, Dragnot, Godless, Iowan, Jennifer, Corey, and Heavy. You guys make what I do possible. And I have different things that are just for my patrons, including early access to my audio podcast. I'm going to get a new person for my audio podcast. Yay! So I'll be able to start recording those again. And I have um, Science Sunday School every Sunday at 3 p.m. just for my patrons where I talk about all of the latest and greatest findings in science. And they also have access to exclusive artwork just for my show. And if you're of a certain level of patron, you actually can have um, a piece of artwork printed out and sent to you. Are you on there, Beige? Or jesus price are you on here and i didn't put you if i haven't put you yet i am sorry so jesus price if you're one of my patrons thank you so much for being on there let me see oh, i feel bad now i'm usually good on and on top of that so jesus price if you're on there and i haven't mentioned you yet thank you for being on one of my patrons i'm constantly updating things so you have to forgive me if you're, if I haven't mentioned your name yet, give me a little nudge and say, Hey Mel, Hey Mel, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, you're not, you're not one yet. Okay. <laughs> oh goodness. That would be cool if you'll be able to be on there. You're not one yet. Well, if you are, I will give you a shout out and I will always, I, I, I heart my patrons. They're important to me and they help me keep the lights on and help me do what I do. You can find me everywhere on the internet. 
just type in Scientist Mel. If you're on Facebook, I stream there. I'm on Twitch, YouTube, Periscope, Patreon, um, all of these different places you can find me. So you can find me there. So I want to thank you, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Human Evolution, the Science of Human Evolution. And I'm so glad you're here and that I get to spend every Saturday morning chatting with you guys. Um, this was a really cool episode for me to do. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you missed it and you have questions for me later, hit me up on Discord. There should be an invite in um, the chat here. If not, um, you can look in the, um, in the description. I'll update the description. You can always ask me questions there. You can ask me on Twitter. You can use my hashtag, HeyScientistMel. That helps me find it sooner because my at's fill. And um, I just love doing this with you guys. I'm so glad you guys enjoy this. And this is kind of what I do. And I just want to share what um, I do with everyone. Just if you guys have any topics, I always have a new poll at the beginning of each week, unless I happen to like do an honorable mention for one. So I'll put how to make beer, subatomic particles. So I need two more things to throw in there. <laughs> well, it's morning for me. Yes, it may not be morning for you. <laughs> and thank you so much for being here. If you have questions, you know where to find me. And if you're a patron, I will see you Sunday at 3 p.m. for Science Sunday School with the newest, latest, and greatest discoveries in science. And so I'm sending you guys hugs. Have a fantastic day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye!